This is Cole Liker. Hi, I'm Neil Collins. You are listening to the unused substitute. The unused substitute. And you're listening to the unused substitutes. Get off the pitch! Hey there, little red riding hood! Ball's gonna bounce down, it's three in the box. Bicycle kick! Goal! Rowdies! What a play! What a shot! And it's one nothing, Rowdies! Good evening, everybody. It's 8 o'clock on Wednesday night. You are listening to The Unused Substitutes. We are live on Radio St. Pete with your uh, green and gold gospel, your Rowdy's Talk Radio, part of the Beautiful Game Network, sponsored by Roughneck Scarves and Golden Gold Press. My name is Matt, and on the other end is someone who is uh, apparently one of three people who did not score for the U.S. women's team yesterday. Stephen, how dare you? I know, I'm so ashamed of myself for not, uh, you know, contributing to the route, but uh, hello everybody, good evening, well thank you for joining us tonight, uh, we've got a packed show, we've got a couple of interviews, one of them live, I mean we've got a, a game to recap from this weekend, there's tons of action and tons of talk, some tons of things to talk about, so yeah, we're, uh, this has been exciting, obviously we've got the Women's World Cup going on, uh, there's obviously tournaments going on other places in the World Gold Cup, uh, South America, there's all sorts of stuff to talk about tonight, not to mention Open Cup, we'll touch on that as well, just because. So, yeah, Matt, this has been a busy week, it's been fun, uh, did you score against Thailand this weekend, I'm just, or the, yesterday, I'm just curious. Uh, I, I, I did not, which is good, because I would celebrate or just uh, punch myself in the face. I don't know if you'd even make it to the sideline to celebrate, quite <laughs> frankly. I mean, you might, you... so everyone knows, this is this is a Rowdy's podcast, but this has been like the hot topic since since yesterday. Uh, I didn't even know like there was even a debate until I, I got home from, from the bar and started seeing everything online, which is usually a, a, a bad thing to do. But uh, so the, the U.S. women won 13 to nothing yesterday uh, against Thailand, opening game of the group stage for the Women's World Cup. And there's all kinds of uh, controversy, supposedly, about whether it was sportsmanlike, whether there was they, they ran up the score, whether the celebrating was... was uh, you know, classless. Uh, what's your take on the whole thing, Stephen? I well, first of all, I love the fact that like a lot of the criticism was coming from Canadians. It was hysterical to me because I'm thinking to myself, first of all, that's the most stereotypical nice country thing that I've ever like seen. Sorry, that, that country was like all up in arms over it. I'm laughing hysterically at the fact that their commentators were trying to make a deal of this. But here's the thing. Like, and, and, and let's point out, this is like one day after, barely one day after, uh, a ton of uh, Toronto Raptors fans were cheering about Kevin Durant getting injured in the uh, NBA Finals. Like, It was funny the dichotomy of, of what you're seeing in Canada right now. But no, okay, so so we'll touch on this. Like I said, we were going to touch on this briefly. The My biggest opinion about this was the fact that, like, look, how many times have we seen in, in NFL – where like the New England Patriots go into Buffalo, or maybe they're hosting Buffalo, and the score is fifty-six to three. You know, ah, nobody cares. Nobody makes a big deal of it. And if a player scored that fifty-six, like if they get to fifty-six because like a rookie scores a touchdown at the, in the fourth quarter in garbage time, nobody's gonna tell him not to celebrate his first NFL touchdown. So. What would, what would our response to that be? Our response, and, and if we're watching like men's sports, it's, well, if you don't want them to score 56 points, you better just play some better defense and stop them from scoring all of that and getting a chance to celebrate. So why are we, you know, why are there some outlets and some individuals that have an opinion that 
the women shouldn't for some reason makes no sense to me because that's a complete double standard. What, you know, we should not tell Mallory Pugh that she can't celebrate a goal, her first in a World Cup, even though just because it happened to be the like what tenth or eleventh goal of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be telling her she can't celebrate her first goal because if something tragic happens and that ends up becoming the only goal she ever scores, then now I'm obviously not going with. But you know, that's a tragic moment that you could have taken away from her. If if she had done quote unquote the sportsman like thing, uh, no, I'm sorry, no, celebrate every goal, celebrate it like it's your last. I don't care what the score is, as Jill Ellis put it, this is the world championship. Yeah, I'm not, and it's, I'm, I'm not expecting my players to play down. Yeah, and 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 Thailand kind of stormed through qualifying, winning by margins like this, and it, it, you know, it's not a thing. Uh, so when I, I started seeing a bunch of the the, the stuff online about it, and, and a, a lot of it. I don't know if I would say most. I don't even know. It definitely wasn't all, but a lot of it kind of turned out when I was reading through it. Kind of went like this: is first people were saying it was unsportsmanlike, and then uh, they'd get some pushback about, you know, hey, the, the game's ninety minutes long. If you don't, if you don't want us, them scoring a ton of goals, don't make goal differential the first tiebreaker. You know, the U.S. is in the same group as Sweden. They're both likely to go into the last group stage game uh, level on points. This is going to be, you know, what could decide the, uh, the the who wins the group and who's second. Um, and then, they, then the, 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 the reply back would be something along the lines of like, well, you know, the scoring's okay, but the celebrations were unnecessary. And then someone would reply back with, you know, some of these women are, are, are it's their first time in the tournament, their first goals in the tournament. And, and then they would say, well, uh, it, not all this. I mean, some of the celebrations are fine, but, you know, uh, Megan Rapinoe's was, uh, was was overboard. Which I'm gonna say two things for that. Number one, looking at most of the 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 timelines of the of people who were saying things like this, it's people who already had problems with Megan Rapinoe for one reason or another. Uh, secondly, if you've if you're complaining about the about that celebration, then you've never seen Megan Rapinoe celebrate a goal before. Like she's grabbed the sideline mic and sang "Born in the USA." She's taken the the corner flag out and and used it as like air guitar. Like, was it overboard? Sure. Was it extra? Absolutely. But that's what she does. This is nothing new. So you know, th- th- that's the way it is. This again. This is this is the World Cup. This is what they've been working for for uh, four years since the last one, or for some of them uh, even longer because they didn't get picked for the last one or didn't get on the field for the last one. If you're not going to celebrate scoring a goal at the World Cup, then I, I don't know if I want you on my team. Like, you've got to be fired up to go. Yeah, and I, I'm in total agreement with that. Like, it just let's let's run rampant. I want nothing. That's a great World Cup. So I'm not going to tell them to stop celebrating because they're winning too good. Nope, not going to happen. I love it. Go girls. Let's go and win this thing. All right. So let's move on. Uh, this is the first time you've had to do a show, a, a losing show. They've been on a winning streak ever since you uh, you came in, and even before. Well, I mean, well, if, if well uh, the the open cup. We'll talk about the results. league, though. <laughs> we'll talk just. Yeah, I I was thinking about it when I was uh, putting this stuff together, and I'm you know, one way of looking at it is well, it's our uh, our, our first loss in the league this year. But then another way of looking at it is we've now lost two out of the last three in all competitions. Yeah. Anyway, listen here, Matt. We're not we're not dragging this thing down yet. Come on, you got to keep our head above water. Do I should I put the panic button away? Yes. Okay. Yes, you should. And here's why. Fine. Let's get into this. So we lose this match three to one. Now, if you remember, if you've been paying attention, if you've been listening to the show as you should, as a good disciple of the unused substitutes, the one of the things we talked about last week was the fact that Dave Sarakan is an amazing coach. Okay. And he plays a very religious 4-1-4-1 system, okay? And one of the things that I said last week is that we are going to be playing in North Carolina against that team. They would be the most organized team that we were going to play up until that point in the season. Guess what that was last week? The most organized performance we've ever played in the season up until this point. Right. You go back. You look at the average positioning of the players at the end of the match. Their average position, they literally kept a perfect 4-1-4-1 shape for 90 minutes on average for their average positioning. It was technically 
a very, very well-run and executed game plan by North Carolina. It was. Here's the amazing part. We were killing them in almost every aspect of the field for that game. So that's the cool takeaway from this, right, is that even though they were able to keep their shape and they weren't, we, we weren't pulling them out of position or, or stretching their formation at all, and that's unfortunate, but we also played, arguably, one of the best games we've played all season. And I know that's going to strike a nerve. I'm sure a lot of people are going to look at that and go, how could you possibly say that? So here's the interesting thing. In that game, we completed 480 passes on the night. That ends up being the fourth highest passing total for the entire season. That's only behind Charlotte, who we, of course, dominated because Charlotte's terrible. That's behind Indy in Indy because behind Hartford, of course, another team that's terrible. That was 480 passes is the fourth highest for the year. We look at shots. We had 17 shots on the night. That's the second most shots we've had all year. Mm -hmm. That only comes second to the Hartford game. Shots on goal, we had seven. Seven shots on goal is the third highest shots on goal number we've hit for the season. That only comes behind the Charlotte and Hartford games. That was a top performance for this team all season. We had the most atrocious luck ever when it comes to Adoro missing that unbelievable shot by a mere, what, six inches? it skimmed off the crossbar right so six inches to the to, to, you know further down and that ball's coming off the crossbar and going across the line six inches to hottest shot when that goes off the uh, the far post when he does that like chip that turns into a shot type deal do you know how unlucky it is on a rainy night because of course that was after the rain came through so now you have a wet goal post at that angle and you hit it off and it goes straight back at you that's i mean it's a billion to one hit yeah, I mean, I was uh, re-watching it this afternoon, and, and Tejada could have easily had three goals himself in that game. Uh, and, you know, we, we talked about we've talked about in earlier games this year how it, it's important to, to get a win when you aren't playing your best. Well, I mean, and this is the inverse situation. We played really well. Like you mentioned 17 shots, seven of them on target, which is a, a huge number for like the, the chances that were created uh, and just – didn't manage to get any them in. Their, their goalie had a had a, a nice game for himself, and and we got unlucky in some situations. Uh, passing accuracy of eighty three percent, fifty nine to forty one in possession. Uh, when you watch it, it, it like yeah, it's three one, but it feels a whole heck of a lot closer than that. Uh, yeah, and honestly, and honestly, I think that game really should have probably ended two two. The way that I look at it, I mean, it, just based on the the way that that game was trending. I mean, again, I predicted a one one draw last week, so uh, yeah, that was just my perspective of of how I saw it. Two to two would have been a fair score line on the night. Like if if Adoro puts that one shot away and, and it goes off the post the right way, then yeah, that's it. It's two two. Yeah, Adoro gets and that, and 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 maybe McCarthy doesn't have that you know one in a hundred uh, chance yeah. mistake that he has. Uh, right? like, you still have to happens, tighten up. You, you if know? you go back, the, the the first two goals for them, I I think are clear defensive lapses. Uh, so you, there is some work to be done there too. But you, at the same time, having you know what we had, uh, Leo was out for a hamstring injury. Uh, David Najum, who we're going to hear from later on in the show, was uh, on the other side of the planet. Uh, we still haven't had Sean Barry back in a while. So you had some other uh, names and faces getting in there in that game. I don't want to say, like, you know, accept it, but it's not a surprise that you had some of these situations pop up. Now, it's for, it's fair to notice. I mean, obviously, Leo Fernandez missing is a huge hole, right? Like, that's a huge problem. However, look at what we how we lined up for the night. We tried, and, and again, we've seen this in the Open Cup now a couple of games, where Neil Collins has really been trying to emphasize pushing – Caleb Richards into the midfield role as a left outside mid. We tried that against North Carolina. Here was the issue. He did fine. He actually wasn't so bad. What was interesting is the fact that Malik Johnson did not have a good first half on the right side. In fact, he was almost terrible. If you really kind of want to use a a hyperbole term, he had a really bad first half. So one of the things that was interesting was coming into the second half when we start, when we, when we kind of shifted the formation around a bit, we dropped Richards back into the defense, 
We switched Malik Johnson over to the left side. His second half was fantastic. I, he actually, he was, he, I, I, I didn't write down the actual uh, passing numbers, but he was a fantastic in the second half down the left-hand side. And then funny enough, Tahada, we pushed him back into the right midfield role for the second half. His numbers were great. He went 17 for 18 passing in the second half. He had a phenomenal night on the outside wing, and which was great because it shows the utility that we have with some of these players. And I know a lot of people want to see Tejada score a lot of goals. I mean, so do I. But having the utility available where you can do a major formational shift like that and have it work. First of all, kudos to Collins for making that decision and seeing that. Secondly, kudos to the players for executing that kind of a shift at halftime against a team that has been that was playing you really, really hard. So that was something that I noticed as far as the formational tactics going into the night. Now, this was funny, too. We're watching Poku and Adoro being in the midfield, which, by the way, I love that pairing. I absolutely love those two guys playing together because it was interesting. This week, they actually kind of almost traded roles a little bit where we usually see Odoro hang back more than Poku on most, you know, for most of the night, as far as how they play off those defensive midfield roles. What's fascinating about this is that this last weekend, they almost switched that role where Odoro was actually being a little pushing a little bit more upfield than Poku did most of the time. So for instance, Poku went 39 of 52 passing for the night but had 10 recoveries tracking back. First of all, kudos to him because, again, that's a number that a lot of people would never have given him last year when he first came over to the team. So that's a huge step up for him, and it kind of shows the attitude change that he has had as an individual, something that we were all talking about and a lot of people were talking about from last season. Good on him for having that number. But what's interesting is when you compare that to Adoro, Adoro went 46 of 51 passing on the night and only had four recoveries. So you could see the fact that, like, Poku was tracking back and playing a more defensive role in the night as far as what he was doing. And it's funny, too, because Poku, of course, one thing that I love about him that he did a couple of different times, he's not afraid to take that ball and dribble down the middle. Which is great because that's something that we need. Because everybody else plays on the wings. I mean, I mean, everything else about our team is wing play, except for Poku. Poku is one of the only players that will really legitimately try and out-dribble somebody. Mm -hmm. And it is such a joy and a relief to watch that in action. Uh, all right, so we've had our... We we didn't like formally do it the way we usually do, but I, I feel like we've hit the uh, the the good bad. Uh, was there really any ugly besides well, losing? I mean, I don't want to pile on a guy when he's down for a mistake, but obviously the 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 missed ball there, uh, not clenching your hands down on that one, and when he let it slip through, that was kind of an ugly play. Yeah, I, I was surprised. I mean, I really, I'm trying to think. I that's really the first kind of you know mistake I think we've seen McCarthy make all year. Yeah, yeah, and and honestly, it's kind of funny because I think that would rival the Diakite miss hit in the Open Cup as probably maybe the two ugliest plays all year, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny see that. because think about it, like. You compare this year compared to last year, and last year you could name ugly plays all day long. I mean, like every game had <laughs> we, probably one ugly play. We could play. do a show at ugly are, plays. Here we are, like fifteen games, like seventeen games into the comp you know combined as far as uh, schedule and open cup, and we're struggling to find more than like two. So I'll take it. I'm okay with it. It doesn't bother me. Random stuff happens. It's a sport. We're humans. But yeah, I mean, I, I. I I really didn't have any problem with how that game turned out. We were pressing successfully in every quadrant of the field. I'll say this. One thing that's interesting, and again, Dave Sarakan is a great coach, right? Mm -hmm. And it was something that I, I wanted to stress last week is the fact that we have to respect him as a, as a genius. Because, no, I'm not going to say genius, but maybe that's a bit hyperbole too. But the, the fact is, is he's coached at a high level. I mean, he, he, he successfully did a year of interim management 
for a top what forty program in the world as far as a national team. Right. And he did again. He did it successfully for a reason. He he's not dumb. So when I look at how we were able to kind of break that team down a lot, that was successful. But one of the things that was list that we listened to from the Oklahoma City game was that was their coach whose name I haven't written down. Uh, their, Cook. I couldn't tell you. Uh, their but their head coach. They made a comment interesting. Um, I believe it was before the game. I think you may have mentioned it on the broadcast that his goal for the game. That one thing that he noticed going into the game against the Rowdies was that because we play a three back system, that sometimes we're vulnerable to a counterattack. It was something I think that was mentioned on the broadcast as a part of like the pregame comments from the head coaches of that game. Something I think the broadcasters mentioned. It was interesting because he's right. I mean, that was that was 100% correct. And so it's funny because then you look at the game that we just came out of against North Carolina, and he, Dave did the same thing against us, where it was, let's play for that counterattack. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It, it kind of worked. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to ask tonight. Were, you know, were there some similarities or some trends uh, between the OKC and the the North Carolina loss that you you, you noticed, so it sounds like there's there, there's some similarities. They they've watched some tape at least. Yeah, and and again, it's it, some of it's a formational deficiency. I mean, when you play a three back system, you're going to be vulnerable to a quick counterattack because you right. just don't you naturally just don't won't have as many players playing back there. Usually in a four back system, that I mean, you might push up an outside back into the offense, but. Usually an outside, even if he does make an overlapping run, that outside midfielder is supposed to track back a little bit and cover that space, depending on the situational awareness and what's happening. So you're not going to be at really any less than four to five defensive players if you start counting defensive mids. But in a three-back system, especially say where like a Doro maybe tracks up a hair bit further than normal, you're down to three. Most players, most teams play with two to three attacking players sitting up front. You're, so it means what? most counterattacks against us are probably going to be a two on three situation. That's not a bad situation to be in. If you're an offensive team. No, if, if you're on the attack, I'll take a two to three, all two on three all day. That's not bad at all. And I think that's something that's a, a very interesting similarity to what Oklahoma city said compared to what we saw with North Carolina is a similarity there. But I think some of it is just, I think if you play your defensive shape correctly, if you play with the intensity you're supposed to, you can compensate for it. But it gives you an idea of what happens if you turn your brain off for just a half a second. Yeah, I, and I, kind of watching those and thinking about this, it's, it's like, you know, this the system we've chosen to play, uh, maybe not because it 100% suits all the guys we have on the roster, but because we have the talent to make up for the shortcomings versus most of the opposition we're going to play against. If you're if, if if you're, you know, very talented in certain positions or if you're extremely well organized like OKC and North Carolina were, then uh we could potentially face some issues, but on 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 the whole, most of the teams we're going to go up against, we're going to have the ability to exploit the advantages uh in our favor more than it's going to come back against us. Is is kind of the way I, I think the system was settled on. Yeah, and I think that's true. I mean, ultimately, I think that is the case. And it goes to show what happens if you're having bad luck score finishing some shots. You know, I mean, again, that's a game that we very easily, arguably, probably should have scored three goals yeah. at a minimum. I mean, I mean, really, and it could have been more than that. But we had two shots go off the post that were amazing shots that just, I mean, that barely missed. And that game is turned on its head if I, really either one of those goals go in. So when you couple that with just the unfortunate bad luck we had on the other side, I, I mean, this is one of those games where you can chalk it up to stuff happens. And now, of course, again, you pointed it out. It's two of three technically competitive that we've lost. Mm -hmm. You know, we're missing at least one player with, with Leo. We were missing him last week. You're missing Sean Barry. You might be missing, missing Tanari, yeah. depending on how that groin feels. So, granted, you got Ekra back on the bench this last weekend, so that was good. Good on him. For, uh, you know, congratulations to him for getting back to at least that kind of fitness level that he can be considered for a substitute role. But I mean, these—it's gonna be—it's gonna be interesting to see how mentally 
we're going to recover. Again, we've had a week to stew on this. We've never had to deal with a week, a full week, to stew on a loss. This is the first time that's happened all season. Yeah. You know, and I know I mentioned that about the scheduling and the change of pace for the scheduling last week, but that's – this will be fun. And, I mean, obviously, we're going to do a good in-depth uh, review for Charleston. We're, we're trying to show you guys what it's going to look like against that team later on in the show. But, yeah, I mean, honestly, I cannot complain about this weekend. It was It was legitimately, in my eyes, one of the top performances we've seen the Rowdies play in all year, especially – considering the opposition yeah uh a couple of things i want to throw out there and uh, i've mentioned this i think before on the show uh uh chris hockman who used to work for usl and now is uh, still locally based uh kind of does his own like uh, uh like weekly uh stats review analytics review he calls it uh a couple things that stood out to him and i thought this was interesting too um that, that were probably factors in how the way the, the game turns out uh, we were not good on aerial duels this time. Forty uh, percent, when usually I think we're in the the, the mid fifties. Um, also, in North Carolina had twenty interceptions in the attack. So uh, there are some things, that, and that's one of the things about them being as well organized as they were uh, to be able to do stuff like that. Well, uh, as our next guest just uh, <laughs> just kindly pointed out, and he's not wrong at all. Uh, it wouldn't be an episode of the unused substitutes if we didn't have some weird technical problem. But I think we're going now. I think we're good right now. If uh, uh, if you can hear me, feel free to tweet me and let me know. Uh, if you're on radio, listening on Radio St. Pete, and you can hear this, uh, Stephen, try hopping back in now, and we'll uh, we'll try and pick this up wherever we left off. Um, so on the line. See, it's always weird when you have like trying to like get back into it when you have all these weird problems. But anyway, joining us right now, uh, the man I kindly refer to as the Emperor, from uh, seated uh, in his box at the stadium, uh, Mike Pendleton. Mike, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm great. I'm happy to be here with you guys. Uh, we got to ask, or, or with just you. Uh, yeah, it might just be me. Uh, we got to ask, did you score for the U.S. Women's Team yesterday? I did, yeah. I had a hat trick. Nice, yeah. and I ce- I celebrated too. I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, you know, I'm 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 partially mad because I'm half Canadian, so I'm gonna you're gonna have to say sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We just can't have this going on. Uh, hold on. We we might have Stephen. Stephen, are you back? You actually do have me, and I apologize so much to everybody <laughs> listening that this keeps happening because there's nothing more embarrassing than trying to promote a radio show that you're just randomly drop out of. No, like I it is my, I, I so think this bad. One was, was on me, and I'm not sure how, but oh? I saw I saw you like drop out, and and then you came back at one point, but I never could hear you, and I just kept trying to talk. And I'm I'm like I'm I'm going through open cup scores and everything, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on. And all of a sudden, I look over at my screen, and I like there's no audio going out to 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 Radio St. Pete as far as I know. Uh, back then, so it it might have been me. I eventually just turned off a bunch of things and and restarted. And oh, uh, that makes me feel so it, much. Matt, you just made my night. That made me feel so much better. <laughs> I don't because know if it honestly, was me, but to make you feel better, I'm going to take the blame for this one. Mid mid sentence, all of a sudden, I couldn't hear you anymore, and I'm like, okay. This is weird. Well, let me go ahead and quickly hang up and log back into the group. And usually, and, and for folks at the home, like, that's all it took. Like, if I was running on Wi-Fi, sometimes my Wi-Fi would randomly drop out. So now I've, ha- I've got a hardline connection to my internet now. I, I went out and made sure I could do that. So since I've done that, I haven't had any issues. And then all of a sudden you drop out. I go ahead and hang up. I try and log back into the, to the conference group, and I couldn't hear you guys talking. And I'm like, okay, this is different. Something is really, really wrong here. So I kept doing it over and over. You saw me drop in and out, drop in and out. Every time I came, nothing. I could hear nothing. (laughs) This would be really fun when I try and edit together the uh, the podcast version of this. Right? So it was funny because then you tell me, I I happened to, of course, what did I do? I went on to Radio St. Pete, started listening to the show, and it was right when you basically came on and said, well, Stephen, if you can hear this, you might want to try along. I was like, oh, my God. I'm I run back over to the computer, log back into everything, and sure enough, it worked. So 
I, 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 uh, I'm sorry, everybody. That's all right. We've got, uh, we've got everybody here. We've got Mike on. Uh, Mike, first of all, for the very few people uh, who, you know, it seems like all of soccer Twitter uh, knows you. I, I dare say you're, you're Twitter's favorite Rowdies fan. Based on everyone's I don't know, I don't know, your graphics and everything. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do with Ralph's Mob, first off. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, I'm i the CFO treasurer of Ralph's Mob, and I've been doing that for a few years. I've been involved for maybe five years or so um, with Ralph's Mob in various capacities. Um, and I'm a guy who spends entirely way too much time talking about soccer on Twitter and Reddit. And um, that's pretty much, I think that's pretty much my, my gig. Um, for the most part, I think a lot of people know me from attendance threads. It's something I've been doing. Also been doing that for the last five years or so, tracking attendance in lower division soccer. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's, that's what I do. You know, I, I got into this, I say the story why I even got onto kind of the Twitter, the soccer Twitters or Reddit is. I uh, didn't have a lot of friends that I grew up with that really loved soccer or were into it, and I needed somebody else to talk to besides my dog. So that's how I got. That's how I got to doing what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, before we we go any deeper, do you just want to talk about how great the Champions League final was? Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing, and we made the. Uh, we were we went to Birmingham. I was part of the group that went to Birmingham, so we actually watched a good a group of maybe uh, seven or eight of us went to. Uh, the bar where the Birmingham uh, Liverpool supporters group went, and it was uh, amazing. It was really, it was, it was remarkable. I, I'm a, I'm a natively from New England, um, so I am a, you know, Red Sox fan who won it. The Patriots won it this year. Liverpool won it. Tonight's Game Seven for the Bruins, uh, which I know is going to bum out a lot of listeners, but uh, it's been a pretty good year. And the Rowdies are in first place, so it's, uh, it's a good year for, in my household. Uh, so everything's coming up Pendleton, huh? Everything is. Yeah. I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. You guys in the Liverpool garbage, blah, blah, <laughs> blah. As a, oh yeah. Look, I don't yeah, have anything more to do this with. So, so we, I, we've I already, we've already really crossed the threshold now of too much, uh, Liverpool talk now that I'm on the show. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about Virgil van Dyke. Yeah. <laughs> Balan de Virgil. Um, Mike, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in and just say one thing. The only reason why I still love you is you keep producing those saxophone videos, and I think that's the coolest thing <laughs> ever. I, I, I was hoping you were going to mention that in the, 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 the where everyone knows him from, from Baker Street. It's Baker Street. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's your. Yeah, that's that, that's absolutely was a smash hit. <laughs> it, yeah. It's way better than the uh, everyone putting it to Titanic music. I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so sexy, you know? All right, so uh, first thing coming up, so June is 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 Pride Month. The mob's uh, really involved with Pride Razor this year. Uh, what's your what's your uh, what's your role in all of that? Yeah, so there's a group. Of, I think Matt McGee is actually the one who started it with our group. We did a little bit with Pride Razor last year, just kind of dipped our toes in the water. Um, but between Matt, uh, Jonathan Silva, and myself, we've been kind of running the. Uh, pride raiser show for us um and it's a really cool thing you know it, it was started a couple of years ago by the guys uh up in detroit and chattanooga um just kind of as a friendly challenge uh to try to see how much money they could raise and you you could you saw it happening on twitter them going back and forth um to raise money for uh local lgbtq uh, uh, uh charities and uh, so, like I said, we dipped our toe in the water last year, uh, but this year, you know, it's a big year for us. It's our 10th anniversary, and uh, we thought we could do something bigger and better with it than we had done uh, before. Uh, and for St. Pete and Tampa Bay in general, you know, Pride is a really, really big deal. I don't know, for anybody who hasn't gone to St. Pete Pride before, it's one of the biggest Pride festivals in the country, one of the biggest Pride celebrations in the country. Um, so, you know, we looked at it and said, you know, of any place that should be doing this and doing this uh, big, you know, we should be doing this big because uh, it's such a big part of the community. Uh, so you've done the, the, the mobs doing the uh, the donation. It's like a per goal donation. And then also 
uh, doing a scarf. So I, I still have to get there this weekend and, and, uh, and pick my, uh, my scarf up, but you also did one for, uh, like pride razor, like nationally too, didn't you? I did. Yeah. So last year, um, uh, I think one of the guys from Detroit city, uh, FC designed their scarf last year. And this year, uh, they asked if I, uh, if I would want to do it. So I was happy to, happy to do it. So we've got our mob pride razor scarf. Uh, but there's also the national pride razor scarf that's out there that supporters groups can kind of get their hands on uh, for people who are interested in it. Um, so, yeah, it was really, really cool. Cool to be doing helping locally here, but also to be helping out with uh, what they're doing. They're doing great things, you know, across the whole nation. Uh, I saw the uh, the tweet earlier today that what the, the, the mob pride razor is up to, like, I think it was like $35 for each rowdy's goal. Yeah, yeah. So we are at forty five dollars nice. per goal. Yeah, yeah. And we only netted one last week, so hopefully the boys can turn it up this uh this coming weekend. But yeah, forty five dollars worth of pledges per goal. Uh I'd love to see us get, you know, some of the supporters groups that have been doing this a little while, like Detroit's up to like seven hundred per goal or yeah, I was gonna mention like my thought Detroit was like seven fifteen. Like you said, it, it, it's something they've been doing for a while and they uh they can they kind of started it. It'd be great to see if we get to anywhere near that level. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm pumped that, you know, people are buying scarves and that's one way that you can participate. Money from the scarves goes to the same uh, organization that we're raising money for, um, for the per goal as well. So we we have a lot of participation. Uh, but it'd be awesome to see, you know, if it's a buck or two bucks or 50 cents or whatever, you know, anything, anything anybody wants to pledge per per goal certainly helps. Well, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Uh, I, I'm a part of this. I've, uh, uh, I've I've actually one of the uh, the pride raiser uh, per goal uh, donors. I'm I'm ready up. If now, Mike, I if you can also talk about for a minute here. Um, obviously, you know we've talked about you know the different efforts we're using to raise money. But what is the actual uh, uh, charity, the foundation that we're actually raising this money for? If you could go ahead and give us a little introduction to them. Yeah, yeah, that would be uh, so. Metro Inclusive Health is the name of the organization. Uh, they're a 501c3 based here in Tampa Bay, which is one of the one of the really cool things about Pride Razor. There are a lot of other, you know, playing for Pride, which is also awesome, um, is out there. I know some of the players are involved in that. Cool thing about uh, Pride Razor is it's all all the money goes locally. Um, so this is a local charity based here, a local organization based here in Tampa Bay, and it's focused on kind of health and wellness uh, for the LGBTQ. Uh, community here in Tampa Bay. Uh, and they have centers here in St. Pete, in Tampa, in Clearwater, and up in Pasco and Newport Ritchie as well. Uh, and their focus is really, you know, everything around kind of the health and wellness for, um, for that community. So whether that's, you know, HIV testing or health care for folks that are, uh, or are managing having HIV, um, to counseling services, um, for folks who might be coming out or counseling services for families. Um, it, there's, uh, and educational programs as well. So there's kind of a wide range of kind of physical and emotional well being that the organization looks after. Um, and like I said, it's really cool that all the money that we raise here is going to go locally, um, to Metro, which is going to do good for folks in our community. Absolutely. And and I'm going to throw this challenge out here as well to to those that are listening and those whether you listen live or on the podcast, I'm going to throw this challenge out here publicly. I, I will absolutely uh, I I will buy a scarf for anybody who would like to. If you if you want one of these scarves that Mike has designed that that, that the mob is raising these funds for to to, to get over to, to Metro. If you are listening to this and you don't necessarily have the funds you you want a scarf, I will buy you a scarf. So send me a message, meet me at a game. I will absolutely buy a, a scarf for the first person who wants to come and meet me as far as that's concerned. I I want to I will contribute in that way. That cuz like I said I'm already doing the uh the per goal as well. So to, like I said, to those who are listening, definitely reach out to me on Twitter, reach out to me at a game, uh, coming up to me in person, and let me know what's going on. I will I will buy a scarf for, for a person who wants one right now, as far as that's concerned. So uh, that'll be another way that I'll contribute to this. Uh, now, it, to switch gears a little bit here, obviously we've got a, a home game coming up, but it's not a normal home game. Uh, this is going to be the first edition of the newly created No Quarter Derby. So... 
that means for those of us, uh, for those that are the uninitiated for Ralph's Mob and the Rowdies, this means that it's going to be a Sons of Pirates night. So if you want to dive into a little bit of uh, briefly into the little bit of the history of Sons of Pirates and uh, just kind of where we came up with the theme and uh, what it means to have a Sons of Pirates night. What's the expectation uh, for those folks that are coming? Yeah, so for it's easy for folks who have Sons of Pirates gear, right? So on Sons of Pirates night, we tend to dress in black and we've had scarves and shirts in past years, usually kind of special event um type things where we sell sons of pirate rouse mob sons of pirates gear so if you've got that gear at home that's definitely you know the way that you want to go otherwise for the most part we're kind of wearing black up you know up in the section um, but we usually reserve sons of pirates nights for special occasions you know whether it's a playoff game or sometimes a road game um, or a big matchup on the calendar uh, and like you said Stephen, this is the first edition of the no quarter derby which is cool because we haven't had kind of a trophy a, lo a local ish you know derby trophy that we've contested since we left nasl um so this was a partnership between a couple of the supporters groups up in uh in charleston queen's and queen anne's revenge and the regiment uh and then skyway casuals and ralph's mob to have something that will play you know a two-legged um, series with them. First one is tonight. Next one is in August away at Charleston. That's where it will be decided. Uh, and there's a really awesome um, chest that will be the kind of the trophy for this for the Starby. But for Sons of Pirates night, it's you know, like I said, it's for a big event. Yeah, no. uh, and uh, and big so, so everybody will be uh, dressed in black. Just, uh, just totally lost my train of thought on that one there for a second. Uh, yeah, I uh, I still remember uh, doing Sons of Pirates nights back when uh, when when the Strikers came to town all the time. And uh, one that sticks in my head was I bought one of those giant uh, giant pirate hats from like Target when they did the, the Halloween costumes, and they always have like the giant oversized foam things. And it was that was the game where it poured so hard that we all had to go in the concourse, and the, the, like the concourse was flooding out and everything. Uh, Walking back to my car after that one was a fun situation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I gotta imagine that that might have melted too. You know, you're, if you got a kind of a Halloween costume pirates hat, I can't imagine it withstood the monsoon there. Yeah, that was that was one of those like I had to. I, I think actually I had to like when I got to the car take off my socks and shoes because they were soaked so through, and I just drove home uh, over the Skyway barefoot, which is a, also a fun experience. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I mean, obviously, Sons of Pirates, we've had, I mean, we've been doing this for years now. It was, uh, now, for those, a little bit of history on this, uh, uh, the the idea came as like a, as a way to acknowledge the, the pirate theme of the area, right? Because, I mean, the Buccaneers have obviously, and, and between the Buccaneers and Gasparilla, like, pretty much everybody around here has some sort of identity to a pirate theme in some capacity. So, creating the Sons of Pirates theme was like our idea for that, and... What's cool about it is that obviously there are people that do legitimately dress up in full pirate gear, which we, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I thoroughly encourage that. Like I love, especially on the Sons of Pirates nights. And and there's a reason why one of the lines in the chant that the mob has sung every game is burn, destroy, wreck and kill sons of pirates surely will. It's a song that we've sung forever. We've put it on a scarf. I mean, it is it is an integral like alter ego identity of Ralph's mob. And so it's always been fun for us. We've always done things. That's kind of our alter alternate theory. Now, let me ask you, Mike, because this weekend also is something a little different as well with the fact that we've got a lot of mobsters that are going to the Rays game this weekend yeah, now yeah. now is there any consideration for what you're hoping for folks to wear at both because i'm pretty sure they were expecting to invite everybody to wear green and yellow and maybe <laughs> everybody's wearing black i don't know how that's gonna go yeah. is there any suggestions for how you want uh folks to handle that if they are attending both the rays game and the rowdies game this weekend yeah i'm not i mean i'm not sure if people are going to be doing costume changes in between uh in between the two um, I think for the most part, I, I think there's kind of was a little bit of an expectation will probably be in Ralph's mob gear. Um, and so I think a lot of folks, a lot of folks who are in the mob now probably have Ralph's mob, Sons of Pirates, um, Sons of Pirates gear. Um, 
you know, I honestly hadn't even thought about that, you know, about people going back and <laughs> forth and whether or not they're going to, I know that there's going to be a shuttle back and forth. I don't know if people are going to be changing in the shuttle en route or not, but, um, but yeah, I think there is, a, I think, I, I don't know, there's definitely not an expectation that people are going to show up in raise gear to that. Um, I think that, uh, I think the hope is, you know, people will be ready to go for the Rowdies game. They'll go have a good time um over at the Rays game first and then um and then hit the shuttle and hit the pregame party at the stadium and have a good time. Are uh, are you you guys going to the uh the both parts of the double header? Are you doing the Rays game first? I will be. I'm going to I'm going to hit up the Rays game. So, two games in one week then, huh? Which is funny, and I'm sure if if anybody from the Rays are listening, then they're going to find out this is scary. I haven't been to a Rays game at all in probably like eight years, I would think, is probably a safe bet. I mean, it's probably been about that long. So it's going to be funny going to two games this week. But Yeah, because yeah, uh, I'm no, – go ahead. I'm not going to make it. No, I'm not going to make it, but I will be – and because I will be out in the parking lot for the Rowdies game, um, have it where – as a pickup point for pride scarves and for people to be able to get their pride scarves. Uh, if they want to get one before the game. So that's where I'll actually be. Um, but, you know, in another night, I, that would have been, it would have been awesome to be able to do that. And even as a lifelong Red Sox fan, five generations Red Sox fan, I think the Rowdy's Ray, the ac- acquisition from the Rays has warmed my heart a bit um, to the local baseball team. Yeah, I uh, I was I was asking that because Steve and I are actually going to uh, tomorrow night's game. Uh, we managed to, uh, to 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 wrangle some tickets in a suite for the night, so uh, I wasn't going to well, do it on not Saturday. Not exclusively for us, Matt. Let's be real here. We're not that special. We're a part of the uh, Radio St. Pete crew. Look, look, look. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you say that because people are going to think that uh, that I t- just took all the Patreon money and, and bought suite tickets, and that's totally right. not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll be out there. There's a little uh, little Radio St. Pete uh, uh, group going out for the game, and we got invited, so we're gonna we're gonna go to that one. Uh, you mentioned being out in the parking lot uh, for the the scarf pickup, which is actually answered like the next three questions I was gonna ask uh, was where where can people get it, and are, are you still gonna be out there? Uh, do you know off the top of your head since they're the game is starting early, are they still opening the parking lot at the same time, or is it they're gonna open that earlier? uh as well yeah i think it's the same time because i don't think that anything changes with the saturday morning market which is okay. usually staged out there so um i think everything will be um i think everything will be be kind of the same thing will be set up uh probably usually i set up around five o'clock um for pickup so you know between four and five i'll probably be set up this time around uh since the game is about an hour earlier um and people can pick up their scarves there. They can purchase the scarf there. You can also reserve yours online and then pick it up in the parking lot as well. Um, and we're shipping them, you know, to anywhere you want them shipped to. You can we can certainly uh, ship them out as well. All right. Well, I will come over and uh, and see you to get mine for this weekend. Uh, Mike, thanks for uh, for for sticking through our uh, our our technical problems and uh, and and diverting your attention away from the uh, the Stanley Cup uh, Game Seven for a few moments. Uh, I, if, if you haven't seen, I don't want to tell you what the score is. No, I haven't seen, uh, I actually was watching it since in Louisville to be totally honest. Yeah. So I don't think I'm going to lose my Bruin stripes here, but, um, I was watching, I was watching that before I came on. I've been, I've been keeping a little eye on that one, but, uh, so thanks for coming on. Thanks for, uh, for, for, for bearing with us. We'll, uh, we'll see you this weekend, uh, Excellent. at the stadium and, uh, and, and, and cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks gentlemen. All right. Talk to you soon, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that was a fun first show interview that I've been a part of. I know. Uh, everything's kind of uh, got blown. Um, we'll put out there, we'll we'll retweet later on the, uh, the, the tweet that they put out there because it has the links for ordering a scarf. It has the links for uh, signing up for the Pride Razor uh, uh, as well to make your, your uh, per goal pledge. Uh, if anyone's interested in doing that, and if you uh, if you haven't, uh, consider it. Uh, all right, are we ready to hop back into uh, rowdy stuff? Yeah, I mean, we'll do whatever we want. I don't know what, like I said, I don't know what happened because the technical glitch. So I don't know what I right. missed there after my 
computer just dropped off. But so uh, we, we kind of cut out like right near the end of, of wrapping up the game. So real yeah. quick, uh, without without a ton of explanation, because I know we want to move on and get to all this stuff. Who is your man of the match? Uh, Adoro. Adoro yeah. was my man of the match. Un- un- undoubtedly, I said it on Sunday morning. Uh, he, I mean, again, when you have the stats that he put up, that was a fantastic night from him. I'm good with that. I'll take that too. Uh, all right. Uh, the results for our our notable games from last week: the uh, top ten versus top ten. Red Bull uh, edged Atlanta three to one. Nashville uh, went to Bethlehem, only not really Bethlehem. Did you see the whole thing with the 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 fake locker room? Oh my gosh! The La, what, where, where that that was played at Lasalle, I think. Well, so here's oh, the thing: was, that was at that was, Lasalle University. That was horrific. Do they not have locker rooms at the stadium there? Or they're just in such bad shape that the players prefer to be outside. God, I mean, who knows? Maybe the doors were locked and they couldn't find the keys. I mean, that, oh my gosh, that thing, that was infuriating. And when you compare that to what happened last night, which we'll touch on later, um, that that's, come on, league. We've got to get this together. Yeah, there was, uh, uh, I saw a tweet earlier today saying that there's, there will be some kind of uh, uh, punishment or consequences for that situation. Um I don't get how there isn't, you know, and I, and I know there probably is someone who's, you know, at least partially responsible for this, but someone at the league office who isn't kind of overseeing facilities. And when the team has to make a change like this for whatever the reason is uh, to, to review it and, and, and kind of do a, a check off. Well, uh, remember though, there's this whole thing is, a, is, is totally screwed up from top to bottom because of the fact that they're not even playing in Bethlehem in the first place because right. the, stadium, the stadium doesn't have lights and so it doesn't meet D2 qualifications all of a sudden. So they don't play in Bethlehem anymore. They play in Philly. But because of the, the saw that was laid this offseason with Philly, the fact that it's been beaten to hell and it hasn't been able to, to kind of take root. They've destroyed the field at Talon Energy Stadium. So that was where they were supposed to play, and now they're trying to find a place to play the rest of their games because the LaSalle thing was completely makeshift. That was the third option for stadium venue. So yeah. I, and they, I, they had even said that, that it was only for the, the – and they announced three games were being moved, and the Rowdies game is one of them. But the Rowdies one they said would not be at LaSalle regardless. Like the, well, just yeah, because they said the next one because the conditions LaSalle. were so bad they couldn't. But I mean, even before that, it got out with that whole locker room stuff. They when they made the announcement, they just said, "Look, we're, we're it's, like it's not available for whatever the date that they're playing that we're playing up there." Uh, so that maybe, but and, they still have no idea where where we're playing. Yeah, that's the scary part, right? Is like technically we could be playing literally in a cow pasture, and we wouldn't know at this moment. Which I mean, might have might have been an improvement, uh, but other uh, other uh, notable results: Louisville two one over Loudon. Really, not a terrible result for Loudon if you think about it. Louisville's kind of woken up and is 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 working their way back towards where people believe they should be. Uh, and Pittsburgh and Ottawa drew two two. The only two like top ten versus top ten matchups this weekend: the Rowdies versus Charleston. Uh, it's a one v eight in the traditional table. And one v where is Charleston nine in the uh, the points per game, uh, and Sunday is Red Bull two in second on both versus uh, Louisville City who is sitting fifth in the uh, traditional table and eighth in the uh, the points per game. Uh, so our, our 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 speaking of our points per game table. Uh, has stayed very similar. The Rowdies are still on top, with, but down to 2.07 uh, points per game. Red Bull and Indy ha- have p- played different number of games, but are have an equal average of two points per game. Ottawa at 1.83, Nashville at 1.78, North Carolina 1.76, really kind of 1.77. St. Louis 1.72, Lou City 1.71, Charleston 1.53. And Pittsburgh just squeaks in at 1.18 ahead of Loudon at 1.09, uh, and Atlanta two at one. Every other team is below one point uh, per game average. Uh, some of the, the 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 trends that jumped out to me: um, there's less than a quarter of a point separating first and fourth place in our points per game table. Tampa Bay, Red Bull two, Indy, and Ottawa. There's almost exactly 20.25 uh, points. Uh, separating five through nine, and then Pittsburgh's uh, about half a point behind almost. So 
Uh, you're starting to see some consolidation in, in different parts of the table again, but it's still very close top to bottom. Oh, yeah. And and the, uh, the big thing about that is the fact that, again, we've seen the fact that, like, you know, for instance, there's only two games between those teams in the top in the top positions in the playoff spots. So that's part of it is I think there, there's not a ton of games being played yet between a lot of those. So, I mean, obviously, it'll start to spread out a little bit unless everybody starts drawing, which I think is what kind of happened in the beginning of the year, which is why uh, the, the stats are so close. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's I mean, realistically, 2.07, two and two. There's basically three teams at a statistical tie at the top right now when it comes to where everybody is averaging and trending right now. So right. we're definitely I mean, it's starting to get a little closer. Uh, we're still a little bit ahead of Ottawa, so I'm not too concerned yet. But, you know, I mean, we're still in the conversation. I mean, we're still in the tier. But, yeah, that middle of the playoff picture. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's like a five way draw. Yeah. Right now for mm-hmm. for those positions. So, yeah, this is going to get interesting later on in the year to see, you know, something to just keep a track of it's going to be fun to watch if teams like st louis keep pulling out results because now they're down to the lower level of 11 games played compared to our 14 so you know it, it's going to be important for them to kind of keep those points you know getting getting wins to keep themselves mentally in the picture <laughs> when they do play games because at the back end of the season i think st louis has a ton of games in the back end going into the playoffs so if they can keep themselves in the hunt just because the sheer numbers of games played and then turn it on for the end, oh, they're going to be a, that could be a dangerous team. And it, and again, you look at their open cup results so far tonight, and that's a da- that's a dangerous team. Well, from, I, from I last night. Say, another thing to keep in mind when, when looking at this, too, is uh, there's uh, several of these teams still in uh, open cup action, still uh, have, have advanced or continuing on. So they're going to have some extra fixtures. Uh, is Indy still in or are they out? They lost to Pittsburgh, remember? Okay, oh, because yeah. Because that, yeah. that was the joke about the home-and-home home with Pittsburgh. Right, 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 right. And so then uh, Pittsburgh, and then Pittsburgh, two, got, and then Pittsburgh got knocked out. In. Uh, Indy's out. Ottawa doesn't play because they're in Canada. Nashville. Nashville got knocked out, too, didn't they? Yeah, they're out. Okay, they're out. North Carolina just got knocked out. They got knocked out after uh, a 4 nothing defeat to NYCFC tonight. St. Louis advanced last night, beating Chicago Fire. Louisville City is playing Orlando right now. It's 0-0. Let's go. Uh, I, I mean, uh, no, no, no you missed uh, Cincinnati. I was going to say, you misspoke there, my friend. That's a, that's a derby. Uh, that's a der- dirty, dirty river derby. I think I've got the... I've got the uh, the 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 column on my screen with the uh, the score <laughs> going by, and it's all Orlando stuff right now. So it jumped in my head. Uh, but yes, it was one last night. Louisville City's playing right now. Charleston apparently is playing tomorrow. Uh, oh, Pittsburgh's yeah. out. Memphis is still in. Uh, which honestly, looking at them, they they're at like you know point seven seven points per game right now. That focusing on the Open Cup might be a, a smart move for them. Uh, cause I don't know what else they still have. Uh, when I'm looking at these group, this group of, of teams that are, you know, below one point, uh, per game, it, it's starting to, to shape up. Like these are the ones you think are going to pretty clearly not make the playoffs. Uh, there's still time. I mean, there's still time to turn it around, but, uh, not a lot. I mean, they're, they're a l- way, way behind on the, on the table. So focusing on this might be a, might be a good thing. Um, Anything else about the uh, the points per game table you wanna you wanna mention before we go to the next part? Nothing that's jumping out to me except for the fact that uh, the Rowdies just need to keep winning games. Just yeah. keep winning games just, and just let's just NFT. have some fun. Just have some fun. All right. So we teased the possibility of a secret interview, not because we wanted to just tease people, but because we weren't sure we were going to get it completed in time. Because when the subject of your interview is flying back from the other side of the planet. It's uh, it's hard to guarantee that you're gonna get a uh, get them in, in in time, or you know, not be so jet lagged or or whatever. Uh, but Jake talked to uh David Najem, who they announced on the uh, the broadcast last weekend was uh, missed last weekend's game. Uh, made his international debut for Afghanistan, playing alongside his brother uh, Adam from uh, Memphis 901 uh, against uh, Tajikistan last week on. Uh, on, the game was on June seventh. Finished up as a one-one draw. Uh, Jake had a few moments to talk to Adam uh, today. I mean, uh, to to David today. Man, I'm just I, anytime something goes wrong, it just throws everything off into my head. It seems like. Uh, 
but I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, and then we'll play for in a few minutes, but I, I was just thinking how this year compared to last year for David is uh, fantastic. Like, you know, he, he lost all that, that, that time last year to injury this year, you know, he makes his, uh, makes his return, scores a goal, like three seconds in uh, has been a, uh, a, you know, one of the frequent players you've seen either starting or coming on uh, for the team now makes his international debut for Afghanistan. Uh, I'm extremely happy for the kid. Oh, no, it's incredible. I mean, his comeback story, just from the fact that he's come back from the injury that he had, I, and this is incredible. I mean, that's a great, great story. And it also shows the testament of the club that we have that, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we got a lot of players that come from big countries. So, you know, like, you know, Jaquita has been playing amazing, but the odds of him getting on Ghana's national team is going to be hard because that's a lot of talented right. players out of him. So, you know, that's kind of the unfortunate part is that depending on, like, we may not see a lot of national team call-ups just because of the from the nationalities that we have representative on our field. But with David Najem, that's incredible. Like, that's amazing. It's a highlight, not only of his career, but again, it's like this is something that we can be proud of for him too. It's getting a chance to play at that international level, even if it's not for a massive sporting soccer country. It's still an amazing story. And yeah, I, I we're going to go ahead and play this interview and... It's fun, and you can hear the joy in his in his voice for the fact that he got to to represent the country of his father, and it that must I mean that's an incredible, and the fact that you can do that with your brother is I I can't even imagine the amount of joy that that he experienced uh, going out there. So we're gonna go ahead and listen to this interview that Jake had with uh, David, and it is it's fun. You guys are gonna enjoy this. Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, how's everything? All great, good. man. How you doing? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, all good. Yeah, it's great to be back, back home in Florida. Are you over the jet lag yet? Yeah, so I think I think I dealt with the the jet lag pretty well, but you know those those long hours and the long flight that that really takes a toll on on the body for sure. So, I mean, you know, even if you get past the jet lag, you're still feeling kind of kind of weak, kind of kind of tight all over the body. I'm sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is kind of like a, a new thing for you in, in the middle of a season to pick up and uh, travel halfway across the world for a international friendly. Uh, this is your international uh, debut with Afghanistan last week. I mean, so just kind of take me through the whole experience. What was just uh, that experience going like uh, going over there? Like, yeah, it was really cool. So um, the coach had talked to me um, a bit last year, uh, a little after my injury. So it was just something in the works for a little while now, and I was really excited, you know, anxious to 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 get out there, um, you know. And as you know, my brother was was involved with the squad uh, a bit last year, so you know that's why I I it was on the bucket list, you know, it was on my list of things to do, and you know, get get over there and play with him and uh, show myself to, to that training staff out there. So I was really excited for this trip. It was you know a long time coming, just. You know, pushed me through my through my rehab process and getting back on the field here. Obviously, um, I was really anxious to get out there, but getting getting out there, um, getting my feet wet with that group, uh, it was it felt like a bit of a homecoming, honestly, because it was like playing uh, soccer in my childhood days with with cousins. You know, it was just the shared roots of of family and culture, really. Um, so it was really cool to to experience that. Um, you know, here with the Rowdies, there are a variety of cultures, and you know, over there, I say there's like one national one, um, but still with subgroups uh, from where the players now live all over the world. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other, but it was just really cool to experience that slight difference. Um, you know, and getting over there, uh, getting minutes with those guys, and you know, they all welcomed me uh, with open arms. You know, they congratulated me on my my first international cap. Uh, just coming back from injury, you know, kind of integrated me super well uh, on this trip. So I think it was a perfect amount of time. wasn't wasn't too long, wasn't too short, but I got what I needed out of it, and you know, what a memory it is. So, uh, uh, so then was the first contact with uh, Afghanistan's uh, staff during your injury last year, then, or was it sometime before then that you guys you, they kind of had your eye on uh, your, their eye on you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know exactly the timing, but the first time I called them, I, I'd already uh, been injured, so it was post-surgery, and, um, you know, they wanted to call 
my brother and me up, but um, you know, fortunately I couldn't I couldn't make it. But he he ended up going alone on the on that trip. I want to say maybe July or August um, of last year. So um, you know, I kind of talked to my brother about his first experiences, and he said it was you know really really awesome, just just different from club soccer a little bit, you know. Um, but that was yeah the first the first uh, discussion there, and then you know he he. The coach told me he's going to uh, track my progress just to get healthy. You know, we'd love to have, have me in when, or they'd love to have me in when I'm, when I'm fit and ready and just take my time and no rush. So, um, you know, I did my work here, uh, worked hard to get back on the field here with the Rowdies and, you know, I was excited and, you know, I, I want to be ready when, when this opportunity would arise. Yeah, I'm sure you gave a little extra motivation during your rehab. Um, so uh, I saw the the starting eleven graphic, and you and your brother uh, were both starting out there on the right side too. I mean that I mean that had to make it a little more special that you guys are out there in the field at the same time for your debut. I mean, wasn't it? Oh, hundred percent. It was easily one of the most memorable moments uh, that I'll that I'll take back with me. I was able was being able to line up on the same side of the field as my brother. Uh, you know, it's not every they get to play professionally with or even against a sibling, but uh, to play together with him during my first cap was was definitely something special. Um, we didn't we didn't travel together the entire flight, but we met up in uh, in Istanbul in Turkey. So that was the first time I'd seen him, you know, probably since January or February. So it's been a little while, uh, and we were a little late getting to that camp just because um, the game the previous week we couldn't miss, and you know the the schedule here is a little different than the, the European schedule. So uh, we, we also got to room together because we showed up a little late. So it was cool uh, being roommates on that trip as well. So yeah, it was, it was a great little get together, um, playing together, training together, and then finally getting that, that game together too. It was, it was incredible, just very memorable. Uh, so what's your, uh, family connection then to Afghanistan I know that you and your brother are obviously Jersey guys but uh so what's your uh family background then with uh, the Afghanistan uh, uh, uh team yes so so my dad was born in the in the country's capital in Kabul and you know all my immediate family members my, my dad has a pretty big uh family he has two brothers four sisters so you know all my cousins from that side they all uh, immigrated over this way but you know a lot of those those roots in the culture state. So, um, you know, the language is something I understand, but it's very difficult to pick up on, but, you know, going to family parties, it's, it's still really relevant. And, um, you know, it's, it's very big in, in that side of my family. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that part of it was very cool because we get to, you know, my dad was excited because we get to represent his side of the culture and, um, you know, all my, my family was really watching and excited excited for that because you know they got to watch both me and my brother uh put on the national team jersey and you know represent you know the entire entire family the entire nation really so it was a really cool uh feeling and just you know getting getting that perspective on things was was unbelievable yeah yeah i imagine it's got to be a pretty proud uh, dad uh, especially with uh, father's day coming up this weekend too Exactly. Exactly. He, he he later told me that uh, he ended up taking that day off uh, from work because I think the the game was on at ten or eleven a.m. in the morning here, and he he's like, oh, how could I possibly go to work? Are you kidding me? There's no way. Both my sons are playing, you know, playing internationally. So he ended up taking taking off from work, watching the game, and yeah, he loved it. He loved every minute of it. That's awesome. That's so awesome to hear. Uh, so what can you actually tell us about the game last week? Uh, I don't think a lot, a lot of rabbit fans had a chance to watch it. So, I mean, I know it ended 1-1. Uh, how did you feel out there uh, on your first time at the international level? Uh, what was the game out there for you like? Yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was a cool experience. I mean, in the end, it's, it's not so different from, you know, from anything that I've been doing, playing soccer with a new group. You know, it was just in a foreign land. So uh, on a basic level, it, it was playing soccer just in a different location. But, the, you know, the whole experience, much more than that obviously um so a little bit um you know the, the geography you know afghanistan and tajikistan they neighbor they neighbor each other with the mountain range that, that kind of splits the two so this is what they were telling me and 
you know, we, we ended up getting a lot of fans from, from Afghanistan who, who, um, you know, either made their way out there or kind of live in the area now. So I think we ended up having three or 4,000 of our own fans and then maybe eight, eight or nine of, of theirs. So it ended up being a really cool match playing in front of a bunch of, bunch of people. Um, so that aspect of it was, was really cool. It very much felt like an international game um from that perspective but you know the game itself it was i was really up for it i was really excited and buzzing to to get around and play and get on the ball uh you know and connect with my brother on the same side uh the, the coach had great things to say you know he, he said he wasn't sure how that first experience would be for me uh but he thought i did really well i felt like i played played well and held my own so it was overall a really really positive first first game i thought uh, just kind of looking back a little bit, just from like where you were last year to where you are now, could you imagine that you'd be uh, this this far back into your recovery already? I mean, back with getting regular minutes with the Rowdies, and now you're making your international debut. Could you could you have seen the this when you were uh, doing your rehab last year at this point? Yeah, I mean that was that was the biggest thing. You know, these were the plans. Um, you know, back when I got injured, these were the little the you know the little even even the bigger goals that I set for myself uh when I was injured you know it's a long a long process and I had uh a long time to think to prepare to plan but at the end of the day um you know the rowdies helped me get to to where I was the training staff and the medical staff they were they're incredible to me so um you know I worked really hard to get to get back to where I was on the field and I had these aspirations of you know getting back playing for the club and playing internationally as well so it, it seemed like so long ago, of course, um, you know, and still I'm, I'm, I'm pushing to get even further along um, and, you know, continue to try to better myself, help the team more, um, continue to get fitter, stronger, and kind of put all that in the past uh, for good. But, you know, it's, I feel like I'm always working a little, a little more, trying to get a little better. So, you know, I feel like it's not 100% done yet just because I'm, so really motivated to keep myself going forward. Awesome, awesome, man. Uh, yeah, I I know we're we're sad to miss you last week, but uh, I know everyone's uh, really happy to see uh, see you make your debut uh, internationally, and uh, we're just yeah, we're so happy that you're back healthy and strong and getting stronger every day, man. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's nice to be back, and I'm excited to put on the Rowdy jersey again and continue moving this this big season forward. It's been, it's been a lot of fun so far, but the best is yet to come. Right on, man. All right, David. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for your time today, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Talk to, talk to you soon. All right. So that was uh, Jake talking to David Najman about his uh, his international appearance in, uh, in the Afghanistan-Tajikistan match last week. Uh, we are now recording this much later than uh, when we uh, what it's been like over an hour, hasn't it? Since uh, we were last trying to do this, Stephen. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Um, I want to say the yeah, it's been I think close to almost an hour and a half, almost an hour almost. and a half. Yeah, getting there so, something like. <laughs> every, I, every time before we do a show, I always double check and make sure there's no like updates that are installing that are, are ready to like restart my computer or something. Uh, and I didn't do it tonight and then lo and behold there were like two that needed to be installed and then one more after that and that uh, apparently is what was screwing everything up because uh, i think everything seems like it's working now uh we're not doing the we're not on radio st pete at this point but uh i I assume it's uh, still working uh but i can hear you and we all heard the interview so magic yeah yeah exactly (laughs) you just gotta get all the the little kinks uh worked out and eventually we'll figure out how to do this correctly like you know semi-pros you know i have like seven other things like in progress on my computer and i was like "Ah, i don't want to check it and you know if i don't have to shut it down right now but yeah i gotta remember to do that (laughs) well okay so that was the that was the david gem interview that jake had uh this week uh again that's yeah what a cool interview and what a cool guy that is I mean, what a chance to be able to represent with your brother. I mean, come on. How cool is that? <laughs> that's an amazing yeah, that's, story. That is, uh, that, that, that's good stuff. I didn't even know that he was, uh, uh, like, in contention for that. Like, all of a sudden just noticed he wasn't on the uh, roster Saturday night, and then they uh, they made the announcement during the game. Uh, so that was kind of cool. 
Uh, but it sounds like he's back and, and ready to go for this weekend, which is, is good. Uh, yeah, just, just in time. <laughs> we need him. So speaking of this weekend, let's uh, let's take a little bit of a, a look at Charleston. So before we get into that, into the actual like preview of them, we got to talk about their open cup situation because it has a direct impact uh on on probably what's going to go down this weekend so they were supposed to play on tuesday night yesterday uh yesterday based on the time we're recording this um <laughs> and the game was called off due to the the, the the referees determined the pitch was unplayable uh it looked in terrible condition there'd been a ton of rain water sitting on the uh the, the turf so they called the game off uh did you see uh Tarek Murad's tweet about it I did. And, you know, it's funny because like, okay, so from what I understand of the situation, I guess it rained not just that night, but it had rained substantially like four days in a row oh, wow. at the at the field. And so the, the pitch was just waterlogged. They were out there for warm ups. They were ready to go. And I guess they had a rainstorm hit that afternoon. That again, waterlogged everything all over again. Yeah, the so it's interesting. Was saturated, it can't absorb anymore. Yeah, well, exactly. And that was the interesting thing. There was a picture that was floating around on fa- on Twitter of the field. And it was like, oh, and it and it looked like there were sand traps out there on the field. Like it was like almost like a uh, a monster truck derby had come through and they almost looked like tire tracks on the field. Yeah. And, it, you know, we're, we're looking at that going, what in the world is going on? So apparently doing a little digging and research on the subject, I guess the grounds crew elected because I guess they couldn't. Like I guess they squeegeed the field to at least get some of the water off. I guess there was divots that were created or at least waterlogged areas that they couldn't get rid of. So they dumped sand onto the field to try and level out those areas to help disperse the water. Oh, God. And that is actually what you were seeing on the photographs that were going around Twitter was after they dumped the sand onto the field to try and make it a playable pitch. And I guess what ended up happening is Atlanta raised a fit about the whole thing. And that apparently the whole reason the game was even put into that in the first place was because of Atlanta, supposedly. It was their complaints that led to the match getting called off by the match official. Right. And I feel horrible for them because, like, Mike... Mike Manginello, who's a head of communication with uh, the Rowdies, he threw a tweet out about the fact that it's like now that Charleston officially has sold that property and they've got like a, you know, they have to a must evacuate the facility before the end of the year type deal now. He made a great point about the fact that there's probably not a lot of dollars being spent maintaining that field anymore. Oh, yeah, probably I, Which, next to none, I'd assume. That really is so depressing to hear after watching Lockhart get torn down. Yep. And how many how many years that that you know that field just sat there, this perfectly pristine field, and everybody just kind of suddenly walked away one day. And that's so sad to think about, like what Charleston might look like by the end of the year at that field at MUSC Health Stadium. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting situation when the Rowdies go up there in, uh, what, late August? Yeah, I'm a little worried about it, actually. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little worried about it because that's going to end up becoming a injury-type situation that kind of scares right. me. So the, the game was called off. There were rumors today that it was going to be forfeit. Yeah, after they said that there was supposed to be an announcement at 12 o'clock noon and the announcement didn't come out until almost five and a half la- hours later. Yeah, we all kind of were wondering if they were going to play it at all. Yeah, so what it's turned out, and they announced it uh, later this afternoon, the game is going to be played tomorrow behind closed doors at Kennesaw State University, which is the stadium that uh, Atlanta United 2 uses. Uh, so now Charleston's going to be playing a home Open Cup game in Kennesaw, which uh, I can't, I don't have it in my head. Like how far you know, Kennesaw is a little bit north of Atlanta, uh, maybe about like 30, 45 minutes north, how far that is from Charleston. And then they're going to have to turn around. I mean, they're probably going to have to leave right from there to come down to St. Pete. Like there's no going back to, to uh, Charleston, I would think in between. Um, 
like the condition they're going to come in here in this weekend not going to be great for them. They like they're already like so they're unbeaten at home. They're but they're one three and one on the road. They're one two and two in their last five. Like they're not a great road team. They're not in great form at this point in time to begin with. Uh, they're missing uh, statistically their best offensive player, Zeko Lewis, uh, leads them right now four goals, tied for the team lead with two assists. Uh, far and away the most chances created. He's been called up to uh, international duty with Bermuda for the Gold Cup. Uh, it's it's going to be kind of a scary situation. I mean, they 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 lost some of these guys the last year or two for uh, international play. Uh, so they've got guys behind there they know can fill in. But this is not the same Charleston team from the the last couple years with some of the the guys they've had. Uh, I don't think they don't have an MLS affiliate right now, right? They were they were. Uh, Atlanta's, I think, for a year or two, and then uh, now that Atlanta two has started, they're the. I think I mean Charleston's just on their own right now. So I yeah, I don't even know. And that's one thing that it's hard to do a, like a legitimate preview for them because they've got guys missing. Uh, their their next two leading scores, they've got two guys tied with uh, three goals: Svensson and Basua. Uh, the two other guys tied uh, for the lead with assists are Higashi and Woodbine. But I mean, they're not a prolific offense. Uh, they've been conceding uh, uh, like 1.2 goals per game, 16 goals total. They've given away four penalties. They've only kept three clean sheets on the season. Uh, between the way they've played to begin with and and the the situation they're in, we got to win this game. Yeah, no, this is uh, this has become an, a must win game. Absolutely. I mean, we've got to bounce back from that loss. Like, you know, a, a draw, and, and and let's be honest, we're still top of the table by three points. A loss last weekend wasn't the end of the world either. Uh, a draw obviously would have been better. A win would have been preferential. But losing that game, if, if you want to keep your uh, kind of your 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 position and keep you and in, in, in stay a little bit comfortable, I mean, like this is a game that you, you've got to go and win. So uh, we'll see what happens with them this weekend. Uh, and, and even then, regardless of the opponent and the circumstances that they're coming in, it's the you, we haven't lost back to back all year officially. So right. this is still a statement point. Even I mean, again, this could be anybody. It's not even opponent specific. This is a must win game because we need to make sure that we keep ourselves in the mindset that we're a top four team, a top two team in the Eastern Conference. We need to make sure that we're coming out and acting like that. We've had a week to stew on a loot on a loss. Let's go out there like firebrands and just absolutely crush it this week. I, mean, I, I I feel another rebound. You know, like we rebounded the week before after losing at OKC. I I feel like this would be another rebound one as well. Uh, I'm gonna say three nothing rowdies. What's your prediction? Uh, I'm gonna go slightly more conservative. I'm gonna say two nothing. Okay. Uh, and as, uh, we talked about, uh, to, with Mike, uh, going on two hours ago <laughs> with it, when, when he called in, uh, this is the double header weekend. You can, uh, for, for 30 bucks, you get a, a ticket to the Rays game, a uh, seat in like one of the lower sections. They're running, uh, transportation from, uh, from the trop to Al Lang and back. So you can park at the trop, catch the shuttle down to Al Lang and then get taken back to the trop to get your car so you don't have to move anything there or you know you can uh park at the al lang and find make your way up to the trop and then catch a shuttle back however you want to do that uh it also comes with a voucher for uh i'm not sure i, I saw it two different ways i saw one said it was a voucher for a food truck item and a beer or one was uh, a beer or food item but either way uh, a voucher for that plus seats in uh well I, I think they said the sections to be determined for the uh the the rowdies game but it's one of the the lower lower uh reserve sections um and we talked about this being a possibility of happening and it's resulted in the the time change for the game like we've mentioned the game's going to kick off at 6 30 rather than 7 30 um one of the things and like i'm i like the idea i think it's cool i wish you know if, if like I already have a Rowdy's ticket, so I kind of don't want to go spend thirty dollars on another one, uh, even with everything else involved. But uh, I like the idea. The other thing that that's been brought up to me, um, 
so you know the uh, the the Skyway Casuals, the Sarasota group, does uh, they do some pretty some fairly uh, intricate tailgates. Uh, oh yeah, based around who the opponent is, and mm-hmm. yep, the, the new no quarter derby. Uh, Charleston's one of the the fan bases that usually sends a decent number of uh, of people down, and now with the the derby, you probably have uh, some more as well. Uh, the uh, the the Casuals are planning a like low country boil uh, uh, tailgate, which takes some time, so. With this kind of being announced a little bit short notice, uh, I know there's some uh, some displeasure at losing an hour of the tailgate time as far as, uh, as setting up and preparation and having time to to do everything and, and have a good time. Um, hopefully that you know I, I'd like to see this like double header thing done again in the future, and uh, and and maybe going forward they'll have a little bit more time and and, and ways to plan this out. But to uh, to make sure to coordinate with the the groups involved, like the mob and 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 the casuals, to just to make sure everything's smooth. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely a uh, an interesting point when when we had, when we heard about the fact that it had been rumored a little bit. Uh, but I mean, obviously, like in our in Jake's article that we posted on our website, the the team had mentioned, or at least the race had mentioned that that was a possibility that was coming. We had heard a couple of rumors before that, you know, through the grapevine that that would be a possibility even before that. And, you know, it's a good point about the fact that like the parking lot isn't getting opened up an hour earlier as well. So it is kind of odd in that context that things are kind of sandwiched an extra hour. I, you know, I, I don't know. Like, it's only going to happen the once this year. I mean, the other game that's going to get moved is supposed to is supposedly getting pushed back is what we've heard is that it'll end up being an eight o'clock kickoff. So, you know, that's, that's some of the rumors that we're hearing right now. It's one of the later games this year, but I, I mean, yeah, I mean some, some better clarification on that might've been helpful or at least just some a little bit more open communication, but this whole thing was thrown together at like the last minute anyways. I mean, let's be real. This is only, yeah. I mean, even from the from the moment we heard a whisper of this possibility to basically today, it's only been what like three, four weeks at the most, right? And they right. only actually made the hard decision on it like a week ago. So, I, I mean, when you're when you're running such a tight window like that, I can kind of understand the idea of not necessarily having the time to address every single need. Some of this was kind of just shoehorned into place just to see if it would work. Right. So, like, I I understand the sympathy of it from a business aspect, but yeah, I hope that if they do have to move up any games for the rest of the year, that at least they give us a better heads up, or at least the I mean the supporter. When I say us, I mean the supporter groups. Right. Right. Um, you know, I hope that like, because again, like Skyway Casuals has made a pretty big deal of the fact that they do pretty big tailgates every time. Like, mm-hmm. that's a that's an impressive setup they have, and they work they work their butt off to get that and make it work as well as they do. So. I mean, just as a as a motion of respect, it, it would be appropriate to at least kind of give a bit more of a heads up the next time that happens. But I get the fact that like this one was kind of out of the blue and a bit sudden, even yeah. for the teams. I so, mean, look, this, this this one's a bit of a test run, probably. Uh, see how this all works out, and and so this is something hopefully that can be brought up and and be included in, in future planning. But to go back to something that Mike said when I asked him, you know, because I thought maybe he would know if he's going there to uh, to do the uh, the scarf distribution. Uh, about the parking lot opening earlier, uh, the morning market's not at Al Lang right now. It uh, from June first to August thirty first, it moves over to Williams Park. Correct. Uh, so, in theory, you could open the parking lot earlier because you're not having to deal with interference from uh, you know people uh, in, at the market getting uh, breaking their 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 setups down and getting out of there. Uh, yeah, but I don't know how the contract with the city reads when it comes right. to like if you even with the market not there, if you get there at like 9 a.m., you're paying for parking at the pay machines. So, you know, I don't know where the contract lies where, OK, now we're going to switch it away from the pay machines to the single event parking where the parking passes come into play, because that might be a part of the equation here is the Rowdy's parking pass distribution as far as that, that contract for those people, that might not take effect until 4 p.m. So they can't, right. they might not be able to just, okay, we're going to open everything up a, 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 you know, an hour earlier for the parking lot side of things. So 
like if that's the case, like I can I get it. Like I mean, there's only so much you can do if there's a contract involved, you know. Right. So you know, if, and if that's the case, I mean, in in my in my own head, that kind of sounds like that would make sense. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's something to work on. But again, it's I, this is a one time thing. It's unfortunate because it happens to be on a game that they were planning a bit more of a more intricate tailgate. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's more. I I mean, obviously, it's not intentional. I think that's more random happenstance oh, yeah. than anything. Absolutely. Uh, so the other thing, and, and we touched on it a few moments ago. Uh, I haven't seen the club announce it yet, but they they have made this change on Facebook. The last game of the month, which is the uh, the Pride Night game on uh, was it the 29th, I believe, against Ottawa, uh, is currently showing on Facebook with an 8 p.m. start, ah. not 7:30. Uh, and the other events kind of going on with the game all say 8 p.m. And I, I noticed that that popped up the other day. Actually, I saw the change for. The uh, the double header game happened like an hour or two before they made the announcement, and then I think around the same time the uh, the the Ottawa one changed too. So uh, keep an eye out for some announcement from them. I, I you know you can mark your calendar if you want to. I, I guess it's not technically official until they announce something, but uh, it seems like that game will be starting at eight p.m. Uh, on the 29th. So. Um, all right, what else do we have left? I think that's really about it. Yeah, I mean, we didn't really go into much of a tactical analysis of Charleston outside of the fact that they're missing a couple of players, but I mean, they're missing their 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 main guy right now, so it how well, they it's, how they compensate for that's going to be interesting. Well, it, it's tr- it well, here's the thing that's interesting about Charleston though is the fact that they've played two distinct formations this year. They started the year playing as a 4-2-3-1. Right. But then they've changed about five or six games into the season to one of the most bizarre formations I've ever seen in soccer. They play now officially a 3-2-4-1. And I don't wow. know of a team on the planet that plays a 3-2-4-1 officially. I mean, it is absolutely the nuttiest thing I've ever seen. So you've got three in the back and yeah. two defensive midfielders. Okay, so that's kind okay. of like how they're, we... They're that, kind of lining up centrally then? I, was, I wasn't sure if well, I to, there. To a point. Them. It's kind oh, of like yeah. how we do ours. It's okay. kind of like how we do ours. We have three back. We have two defensive mids, essentially. Now, what we do is we have an out, you have an outside wing on both sides, and you've got an attacking midfielder. We usually have Tanari up there or right. Steinberger. And then we play with two up top, with Gonzati and Tejada usually. With their with Charleston's formation, they have the three and the two, but then they play with an outside mid on each side and two attacking mids, and then only one dedicated striker up top. Who just works so that's, whoever gets forward? Yeah, so that's the switch. Like, we play with two up top with one attacking mid. They play with one up top with, with two attacking mids. Interesting. It's totally bonkers. I mean, I, I, it's the weirdest formation I've ever seen. I don't know of a team on the planet that does what they do. But obviously it's been working. I mean, the team isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination. So, I, I, I mean, it is crazy. So what they usually do, from what I can tell, is the two attacking midfielders tend to play up a lot. So usually they end up having... They almost operate kind of very similar to our formation, but yeah, I, I, it's it, it's funky. I mean, it is going to be a strange game when you've got essentially the same, you know, lineup kind of going at each other almost. Because in a lot of ways, our, like I said, our, our our setups are pretty similar. So it'll be fascinating to see how this game actually plays, and more importantly, is do they keep that formation with all the personnel that's missing? With the rest that they're not going to have, considering the the, the basically two day turnaround time, I, I don't know. Maybe they switch out to a four two three one or something like that, or maybe they go really defensive. I think I even saw, I think it was like Louisville or something like that was playing like even I think it was the Open Cup game tonight. They were they were playing like five defenders dedicated. Like they actually went in like five three mm-hmm. two or something crazy like that as a form as a formation. 
we'll have to try and keep an eye out for a report because the game, the, even though it's closed door for fans, it's uh, it's open for media. So we'll try and hopefully maybe get some reports or, or take a look at their lineup tomorrow uh, to see. I, I I'm assuming at this point that based on this situation, uh, the, the the time frame situation, the uh, the the rescheduling, uh, the guys that they're going to be missing. Uh, because it's not Lewis is, is kind of their their top guy that, that they're, they're going to be missing, but they've got another player off for Trinidad and Tobago as well. Um, I don't want to say that they're just going to like toss this game away, but with this game tomorrow and then uh, the Rowdies on on Saturday, I, I, I think they're going to probably prioritize the Rowdies game over uh, over the Open Cup at this point, um, and maybe use the open cup to get some some younger guys some minutes or some guys who haven't played as much some some time out there and and save uh, as many start regular starters as they can for the weekend, uh, and, but still probably come in here and, and I'm kind of anticipating a, a a little bit of a defensive setup from them coming in. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, like I said, I, I you and me view the open cup differently, so I would actually take that and flip it. I would think that it would they would emphasize the open cup more and then. I mean, considering they're playing against Atlanta, you know, a chance to knock out a popular team in the region. And then, you know, you just go to, you take a bunch of the kids down to Tampa Bay and you just try and draw out a, you know, just try and draw out a, a point result and just kind of see if you can do a smash and grab for this, for the game against us. You're going to try so, and put that, that Thailand lineup out there. Yes. Where it's like, uh, here's nine players that we're going to play in the midfield and in the back line. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, I I mean, who knows? It'll be interesting to see. Like I said, this is going to be an absolutely fascinating game to watch, assuming that they keep the same formation that they've been playing all year. Like, I don't I mean, when was the last time in like world football that we've seen two teams play each other with three defenders? Uh, I mean, honestly, I can remember, you know, any team that I've watched on a regular basis playing three defenders, though. Yeah. Right. This will be, uh, this, this will be a little bit interesting. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm I think excited. We'll have, a, we'll have a better idea tomorrow when we see what they what they put out there for the Open Cup and what we might be expecting on Saturday. Uh, I'm going to stick with my three nothing though. I think even if they come in and play defensive, I think we I think we've got the advantage. Agreed. Yeah, my my two my two nothing. Obviously, I, I I had this written down as a as a point of discussion already. But yeah, the two nothing I think makes sense. I think. Like I said, either they're going to be dead, dead dog tired, or a bunch of kids are playing. Either way, that's going to give us a, a, a serious advantage. So it'll be a good opportunity. Like I said, it, I, I consider this a must win, not because of the opponent, not because of the scenario, but because we lost last week, and I don't, I don't want to make it seem like it's okay to lose two games in a row. Yeah, so you want to rebound, especially against a team that that. By all purposes, you should beat. I wouldn't care if we're playing New York Red Bulls 2 or St. Louis on a fresh week of rest. To, you don't lose. if You haven't lost two games in a row yet. You've yeah. only lost one game in the league, se- in the league season already in, in general. You got to win. You cannot, cannot, cannot lose three out of your last four because that's a really, really great way. Then it starts creeping into your mind a little bit especially with the schedule loosening up the way it was where you don't play multiple games in a week. So you have to stew on that for a whole week and we're not used to doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I let's just, let's just come out and put this one I, score early and often celebrate a lot. Uh, and let's have fun this weekend. Absolutely. I'm, I'm game. Especially, you know, if you're bringing in the, the react and this is something you you almost never see the reaction online to the the double header announcement was like universally positive as far as hey this is a great idea let's do this like i, I you know i think you're going to see some people in al lang that maybe have never been before or haven't been in a while you know give them a reason to come back yeah and you know it's funny too is the fact that like there was obviously some competing viewpoints as to who the double header actually benefits more. Is this about bringing Rowdy's fans to raise games, or is this more about bringing raise fans, raise fans to Rowdy's games? That's first of all, it's an interesting point. It's an interesting discussion right. because I don't really know. Like, I mean, you can make a pretty compelling case probably for both. I would argue that it actually has to do more with benefiting the Rowdies rather than vice versa, because I think 
with the Rowdies, you're only seating a stadium of 7,000, what, like 700 or whatever in general. Mm-hmm. That's the most people seats you can have in a stadium anyways. It's not like the, we already average over five, oh, almost 6,000 fans a game. So there's not exactly a lot of room for growth. So yeah, uh, from, the, that... from the Rowdies' perspective, like you're already so close to capacity as it is. I mean, we we trend more than 50% full. I think we've trended that for almost six years in a row now. So, you know, it's not like we're we're needing butts in the seats. I mean, granted, we want sellouts every game, but it's not like, you know, you're going to pick up, what, an extra 50 Rowdies fans to go to a Rays game, and suddenly that's going to boost Rays attendance any, especially on a weekend game. They've got 15,000, 20,000 people in the trop. On a weekend, if not more than that, I think. What is it? Their adjusted capacity is twenty five now, I think, or something like that. With the, I mean, they've, with the they've been pulling, you know, under ten thousand crowds. Admittedly, weekday games, but we're in. Yeah, on weekdays. I was specifying now, like it's, yeah, yeah, I was, I was specifying weekend there, since since the double headers are always going to be on weekends. So, yeah. like, I mean, it's not like they need an extra fifty people that go to Rowdy's games religiously to suddenly buy and and do a double header that they wouldn't have normally, because it's not going to benefit the Rays really to doing that. That's the, that's the it, thing, you know, because you're, you're, 50 you're people aren't going to make any difference. You're also, you're not getting the, the, the like diehard every game raise uh, fans because, you know, they've already got tickets for the game. They're probably not going to drop another 30 bucks for another ticket for the raise game when they already have one. And then the bus ride to Al Lang, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't think there's, a, you're not reaching, I don't think you're going to hit a, a big number of, like current season ticket holders of one that haven't gone to the other. Um, but maybe people were like, oh, this is, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a, you know, a unique attraction, something going on. Here's 30 bucks. Let's, let's, let's go do this for the day. Uh, you know, ideally, I guess, assume you're, you're trying to attract them to both would be my opinion. Uh, and, you know, if, if there's, you know, ever going to be talks or, or actual work done on stadium expansion at Al Lang, uh, you know, having that like you know 5500 6000 average uh, uh sales for the games is good but they want they'll, they'll want to push that towards 7000 on a regular basis and create the demand for more seats in an expanded stadium so maybe it's a little dipping a little bit of toe in the water to see if 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 that's a a possibility uh, yeah i mean maybe maybe. what what goes on it'll, it'll be fun i wish like i wish i would have the opportunity to do it on a on the weekend but it just you know maybe next time uh, but let's go ahead and wrap this up because I have a lot of editing ahead of me, like three or four different files to try and piece together. Oh man. Uh, yeah. I feel bad for you. As well as, uh, my, my wife and daughter return tomorrow evening. Uh, and I need to you know, clean the house up before they get back and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and I can't do that tomorrow night cause I'm going to be at the, uh, at the trop in the suite. Yes. And I can't do it in the, uh, the early afternoon cause I just bought tickets to finally go see John Wick tomorrow. Oh, Nice. I've got I've got one podcast sitting around on my phone and it's about the third John Wick and I'm like I can't listen until I've seen it so I need to go see it so <laughs> that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. Uh, all right, so let's wrap this up. We love yous. Uh, I'm going to send it out to longtime friend and uh, fan of the show uh, is uh, laid up in uh, in the hospital. He might be might be on. I think he said he's going home pretty soon. Uh, our friend Dave. Everyone knows Dave. If you, uh, if not, just find a picture of someone holding smoke, and it's a good chance it's Dave. Uh, if it's not Dave or you or Jesse, then it's uh, you know someone new. Apparently, uh, been in the hospital for a few days, and uh, hope to see him back at Owling as soon as possible. Who's your Who's your we love you? I am going to spend my we love you this week on David Najem uh, for representing his country, representing the Rowdies abroad. Uh, you know, that's a great story for him, for his family, for his country, to, for the chance to represent, you know, at our level, you don't see a lot of, you don't get to see a lot of players get that opportunity. So that's my, we love you. I, I, I'm glad that he came back safe, uh, that him and his brother are perfectly fine and healthy. Uh, that's, that's my, we love you. Cause that's an amazing story. I was trying to think, uh, all the guys we've had represent uh and, and and play for their countries we've had uh what the first one was jeremy christie for new zealand way yes. back when in the uh, in the world cup which was kind of cool mm-hmm. uh, i think the only rally player who's gotten that far uh who else have we had 
Pascal Million yeah. was represented of uh, Haiti for a for long Haiti, time. Yeah. In fact, I think he still even sniffs the bench every now and then as far as the, the call-ups are concerned. I think he's playing for Lakeland now too, isn't he? Yes, he's over in, he's over at the tropics. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, uh, is there anyone, off the top of my head, I really can't think of anyone else. Well, I mean, there's. Ex- I know there was. Okay, so, okay, was. so so let's let's distinguish this a little bit, though. Uh, I'm talking people who like represented their country while they were a rowdy. Okay, because I was gonna say there's at least one that left that represented after he left. Well, I think Junior Fleming's got called up this year too. Well, I mean, yeah, Junior Fleming's one. Damian Lowe has represented Jamaica, yeah. before, I think, before he came to the Rowdies, right. potentially. I'm not sure if he did it while he was with us. I think he I did. Think, I, mean, I think I, I think so. Uh, and he was on the – He was on, yeah, I think he's on the Gold Cup roster this year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I, I, I think then, I remember Rob Stone getting a, a, a Rowdies mention in during that game. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, you can't forget the fact that Fafa P. Colt started his yep. professional career here at the Rowdies and became – a player with the U.S. national team for a couple of caps. Got a cap and a, and a goal. Yep. Yep. Is there anybody else? Um, wow, this is embarrassing because this is a subject that we should research before we suddenly spring a this segment is like that. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for uh, testing. I mean, look, we're recording tonight. two hours, two and a half hours later. <laughs> things happen. I mean, this is true, and you could hypothetically even edit this out if we wanted to. I mean, it's kind of the fun part about this. No, nah, we'll throw it in because if we're wrong, someone will tell us, and that's the easiest. Way <laughs> <to find out. laughs> even easier than Google. You don't have to actually do anything. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you to uh, our friends at Wolf Face at Radio St. Pete at the Shamrock Pub uh, for their continued uh, s- support of the show. Uh, thank you to you guys for listening, uh, either uh, online or you know live trying to or uh, in the podcast version. Uh, please continue to share, subscribe, rate, and review so that others can find our show as well. Uh, you can support us on an ongoing basis at Patreon, patreon.com slash unused subs pod. Thanks again to our sponsor, Roughneck Scarves, the official scarf supplier of MLS, USL, and U.S. soccer. Get custom scarves for your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. And that's it for this week. Finally. Uh, finally. I don't, know, I don't know when I'll have this finally all edited together and, and put out there, but hopefully as soon as possible. Uh, Steven, I will see you tomorrow evening. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun uh, Be fun for a social gathering for our purposes. That'll be a great time. And well, then, of course, a meal I don't have to cook, which is nice. Yes. I'll take that. Uh, and then I'll see you again on Saturday. Yes. That'll be a fun weekend. Uh for you, uh, you, you newborn uh, uh, Rays fan. You listen here. I went to Rays, <laughs> Rays games a lot, even before the World Series uh, run in 08. Uh, I, went, I, I went to Rays. I was at the first ever Rays win. How about that? Nice. Second nice. game. Yeah, I – obviously, we never grew up Rays fans, but uh, – or baseball fans, should I say. I was always – I was born and raised in soccer, so – but yeah, we would go to like five or six race games a year. And then basically when the rowdies kind of got started, we pretty much stopped going to race games and did nothing but rowdies games after that. I'm trying to think the, the last race game where I was like, you know, kind of really into it and went there. Uh, they were playing Seattle. I want to say and like Griffey Jr. was still on the team and uh, we were sitting in the outfield, me and some friends and, and, and kind of throwing some banter at him. Uh, he even turned around at one point and laughed, waved to us. But the, uh, the crowd around us was just, you know, first of all, they, they were barely awake, but they were awake enough to like give us dirty looks for the fact that we were daring to speak during the game. And it was just kind of one of those, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I've taken my kid to a couple games and, and, you know, gone with some friends, but it's always just been like, oh, all right, fine. Someone threw me a free ticket or whatever, uh, which is basically what's happening tomorrow too. But uh, <laughs> I have been wanting to go uh, again lately and just, you know, go in there and, and check things out and uh hopefully uh hopefully you know, support these guys a little bit because uh, well they own our soccer team and we wanted to keep doing the, the good stuff so far yeah, uh all right i'll see you tomorrow and then i'll see you saturday sounds good, good. Hey,